I am the granddaughter of a long line of family farmers, uh, corn, soy, and wheat. Spent my summers detasseling corn and walking beans, and that family farming background, I think, instilled me with a lot of hard grit, determination, faith, and fortitude. The thing it taught me most is that people can come together in difficult circumstances to get hard things done, and that's always been a big influence in my life. This was in rural Illinois. Yeah, what, in what town is that? Blue Mound, a population 1,100. We joke that's only if the, ever, everyone's chickens were counted. My father was a United Auto worker for 32 years. He was a welder at a Caterpillar plant. And I also got to start on the picket lines with him, uh, protesting against unfair labor practices. Went to the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, and my junior year came to Washington, D.C. to do an internship. And while I was working in Congress, was offered a full-time job, a very senior-level job that kind of advanced my career pretty significantly and decided to stay in the region. I worked in Congress for nearly a decade. I was John Kerry's domestic policy director for four years before, during, and after his presidential run. And before that was a legislative director and legislative assistant for three different members of Congress. So a policy analyst that focused very strongly on healthcare and environmental issues. And that's been a, a lot of the influence of what I've brought into my own legislative service, the eight years that I served in the Maryland legislature and in the campaign that I'm running for Congress. I am very much tied to my Catholicism and the social justice teachings of my faith to feed the hungry, house the homeless, heal the sick. And when I was a little girl, I thought I wanted to grow up to be a priest, and then I found out my ovaries were going to be in the way of that mission. And through that social justice mission, though, I started to learn ways that you could still contribute that way through community service. And it was on the picket lines with my father and, and, and for years after that in the labor movement where I got to know a state senator who was a mentor of mine. Her name is Penny Severns. Um, unfortunately, she passed of breast cancer at the age of 48, much too soon, but not before she took me under her arm and taught me everything she knew and really encouraged me. And before I met her, I wasn't sure that women did this because I'd only had examples of men who were presidents and congressmen and senators and local elected leaders. And I thought similarly to a desire to be a spiritual minister initially that maybe being a woman, this was going to preclude me from service in that way. And when I met Penny Severns, is when it all kind of came together and I said, oh, women are allowed to do this. And she very much encouraged me on this path. And it was purely from a desire to take what you believe in and manifest it into action. I think that it's really important that public servants take ideas and push them into action, take plans and turn them into law. And that is the spirit of bipartisanship and collaboration and get things done that I've always brought into my legislative work and it has been a big influence from where I was raised and how important that was in the communities where I lived and grew up and similarly in where I've lived on the eastern shore now for many number of years in Kent County as a small farmer. In 2005 Deborah, my wife, and I visited some friends in Chestertown on a Sunday afternoon, and I was so immediately smitten with the county and that community because it reminded me a lot of where I grew up. And the very following weekend, we put a bid on a small cottage and won it. And we started to then become uh, those people who live on the weekends on the shore and work in the Washington DC metropolitan area. And we commuted back and forth for quite a while. And in 2011, we bought our farm. My spouse is a, an herbalist and wanted an opportunity for her clinical practice to grow um, some of the medicines that she would use in her apothecary. And we started the farm, but it's also, that was part of the upper out strategy, which is 
a farm is a very jealous lover and she did not do well with us only being there on a part-time basis. And we were able then in uh, 2015 to move to the farm full-time. So in 2004, I was John Kerry's domestic policy director and at one point left that role to run his presidential campaign for the state of Maryland. And then when he didn't win, went back to the Senate to work with him and take what was our health policy initiative in that presidential campaign, and we turned it into individual pieces of legislation that we were trying to get passed in the Congress. And while that stalled, I started to think, you know, I could get some of this done in Maryland. If I were a state legislator and I took these ideas to Annapolis, we could start making progress on this in the communities where I live. I was already a city councilwoman in uh, the community where I lived and w decided that it was time to run for and win a seat in the General Assembly, which I did in 2006. And the first law that I passed that year uh, in 2007 when I was um, sworn into office was the Family Coverage Expansion Act and it's a law that allows young adults to stay on their family health plans until age 25. And that was an initiative that we passed in Maryland before it became a model that got folded into the Affordable Care Act as national law. Mm -hmm. and, and this was an idea that we advanced in the Kerry campaign in 2004 and I got it done in Annapolis in 2007 and went to, on to work on several of those pieces of, of legislation. Because at the state level, we incubate good ideas and then they get replicated often at the national level. And I felt like some of what was stalling progress at the national level were fights over partisan issues and wasn't, uh, there wasn't a clear path to getting good legislative policy passed. So I wanted to go to the state to get it done. We did that and um, was proud to see that these pieces of legislation that I passed in Maryland became uh, an opportunity for federal law and I wanna continue to do that in Congress. When I was in the state legislature, the eight years I was there, I had the honor to pass a number of initiatives that I was very, very proud of in healthcare, in environmental protection, in supporting small businesses and middle-class families. And I got to a place where I didn't want to just respond to the agenda, I wanted to set it. And I also knew that in Maryland at the state level up to that point, it was never a woman's turn to be next in line. We've never had women elected to statewide office. And I wanted to show that it wasn't about who was next in line, but the ideas that we needed to advance for the state of Maryland. So I jumped in that race, uh, very much a lesser known candidate in a primary against two people who already were statewide office holders, who also had significant amount of resources more than I had as a publicly financed candidate in the campaign. And yet we still came up with 22% of the vote in a three-way race, and I was very proud of that. And I also was comfortable with an up or out strategy. And I was retiring from the legislature and I wanted to either be the governor or to go back and work on my farm full time. And yeah. that's the life I was living uh, when the events of January 6th happened and I very unexpectedly found myself in this race for Congress to hold our congressman accountable for his actions that day. I was focused on the farm, and also in 2017, I started a nonprofit organization called Soul Force Politics. And Soul Force Politics was dedicated to the notion that if we brought more heart centered wisdom into our civic engagement, we could tone down the partisan rhetoric and solve problems and come together as community again. And that's really the spirit that I have lifted into this campaign. From the first days of this race, we have been running a unity coalition strategy where we have invited Republicans, independents, and Democrats to come together to bring change to this district, and people are hungry for it. We are holding house parties with Republicans and independents all across the district. I call it Heather in the hot seat. And the houses are packed with people who are excited for uh, somebody who is willing to be transparent, answer questions, and connect about what our biggest challenges are. 
People are sick of the partisan rhetoric. They want problem solving, and that's what I'm offering. On the economy, a very robust, comprehensive strategy I've put together to address inflation and lower costs for middle class families, support small businesses, and have a hyper local approach towards job creation in our region. On the environment, centering farmers and watermen as part of the solution to the climate crisis. And on healthcare, not just making healthcare more available and affordable, but addressing the provider shortages and the challenges with keeping our service delivery facilities open. We know all too well from having worked hard to keep our hospital open in Chestertown that when the community comes together to make a, a, a reasonable argument and a strong petition about why these facilities are needed, we're able to persist and, and, and win those kinds of battles. Those are not partisan issues I'm running on. These are problems that have been ignored for way too long by a congressman who's chosen to divide us rather than unite us. And the reason why there are signs cropping up all over that say another Republican from Azir is because people are not just invited to believe in the possibility of this. I have 25 years of record and relationship that shows exactly how I deliver on that. I worked with the head of the pro-life caucus in the General Assembly to expand free family planning services to all low-income women in Maryland because the late and former delegate Mike Schmeagel and I had a strong and beautiful friendship that was built on trust and where we came together to understand that our shared goals of improved birth outcomes and lowering infant mortality rates and bringing some additional federal matching money into the state budget for good fiscal policy also met up with my desire to make sure women had access to free family planning services and Mike's desire to lower the abortion rate in the state. They're all connected. When we give women uh, family planning, unwanted pregnancies drop. It's empowering women to make decisions on what is right for them and their bodies. And we got that uh, legislation pushed through Maryland in a bipartisan way because of the history I have in, in crossing the aisle. I worked with Governor Hogan to ban fracking in Maryland and reversing a position that he had on that because of a deep level of research and analysis on a governor's commission that I served on that showed the negative impact of doing that drilling in Maryland on our economy, on our environment. And, and with that history, of not just saying that I have a spirit of bipartisanship, but that actually engaging and working across the aisle to get tough things done, that's what people are excited about. And there has been no other candidate that has challenged Andy Harris with the level of experience that I have or the amount of support at the grass, grassroots level to get it done. We've also raised $2.4 million in this campaign, grassroots donations that reflect the energy and enthusiasm of, of bringing back leadership to this district that is honest, full of integrity, and willing to solve our toughest challenges. On January 6th, I was furious and heartbroken. We were seeing a domestic insurrection against our nation's capital over whether or not to certify an election that all evidence had shown was free and fair. And Andy Harris was one of 147 who voted against certification on that day. He also had to be separated from a colleague in, in, in the midst of picking a fist fight on the House floor that night at a moment when we should have been healing. A week later, he tried to smuggle a gun onto the House floor. And now we know from the January 6th committee that he was one of 10 co-conspirators in the Trump White House in December of 2020, plotting the entire thing. I don't have a problem questioning the integrity of an election. We always, as patriots and lovers of democracy, want to make sure that our elections are free and fair and sound. But by the point that that meeting was happening, 50 court cases had already looked at the evidence and tossed them all out. There was nothing at that moment that Andy Harris was doing other than trying to prevent a peaceful transfer of power and overthrowing our government. I'm not running against Andy Harris because he's a Republican and I'm a Democrat. I'm running against Andy Harris because I see him as a traitor and I'm a patriot. There have been in this interim period of time a significant backlash um, related to 
a woman's right to choose and the decision by the Supreme Court to overturn 50 years of settled law. Women of all partisan affiliations are feeling like second class citizens and are expressing their anger at the ballot box. You're, we're in a different political moment than ever before between the, the threats to women's autonomy, the, um, the, the details that are coming out of the January 6th committee about what happened that day. There's, a, there's a, a, a deep motivation. But we're also seeing at this point in the election cycle, uh, I think a shifting awareness of all the investments that have recently been made in the last Congress that are coming to communities and improving our lives in a very big way. And these are all investments that Andy Harris voted against. The infrastructure package was an investment that is once in a generational lifetime opportunity to grow jobs in our region, to get us universal broadband, to fix our dilapidated wastewater treatment plants that are polluting the bay, to give us transportation grant funding to address some of our rural transportation challenges, dredging for our waterways that are important for the livelihoods of watermen. These are all things Andy Harris voted against, but he voted no and has no problem taking credit when the dough comes rolling in and acting as if this is something he's delivered for our communities. And as these popular projects are, are coming home to roost, we're making sure people know that this was from an investment that the Democratic Congress made and that Andy Harris was absolutely against. But the other thing that's happening right now is an absolute rejection of the extremism that Andy Harris represents. He voted against giving health care to our veterans who were exposed to toxic burn pits. He was one of 17 people that said no to protections for victims of human sex trafficking. He's voted against our first responders at every turn. The firefighters did a unanimous censure against him at their recent international meeting because of how bad he's been for firefighters and endorsed me in this race. On issue after issue after issue, when there is bipartisan consensus in the Congress and there's 15 to 20 people that are on the extreme fringe, Andy Harris is always in that crowd. Now, there's a nonpartisan group called the Luger Center that gives a bipartisanship score and index to every single member of Congress every year to show how willing they are to work across the aisle to get good things done. There are 435 members of Congress. Andy Harris ranks 426th, one of the top 10 most divisive, most extreme, most partisan members of Congress. That's not serving the first district well, and that's what's going to be rejected in November, that I've been running a strategy that we call We Are One. That's our campaign slogan. I'm no longer um, willing to be a part of conversations that divide us into us versus them strategies. We have to rise above partisanship and ideology to come together and listen to each other again to have deep and courageous conversations where we can connect from a place of curiosity and compassion and an interest in finding where our common connections are because there's a whole lot more that connects us than divides us. Dan Rodericks at the Baltimore Sun is probably one of the most cynical guys in journalism and he recently was a fly on a wall at a house party that we had with Republicans and Independents where he was able to hear the way in which I put this um, purpose into action on the campaign trail. And he wrote a very interesting and beautiful commentary about what was happening in those living rooms as I'm having this dialogue with people. And that's what has to happen right now. This can't just be about firing Andy Harris. And as much as I want it to be about an excitement to hire me, because I'm really enthusiastic about doing this job, I've always recognized my name is on the ballot, but all I'm doing is leading a movement, leading a movement for change and, and, and discourse that can bring us back together again, because we don't have to be as divided as we've allowed it to come. The moment we are in right now, where political violence is the go-to solution and we're having conversations about civil war, 
The moment we are in right now is to reconnect to each other's humanity and remember that we all love our country and that we want a lot of similar things for our friends and our family. We might come at it from different approaches, but the approach right now isn't what is important. It's that reconnecting to each other. And that's what this campaign is about. And as I am doing that, we are putting an absolute winning coalition together because there is a hunger, a deep, deep, deep desire on the entire ideological spectrum to be done with all this fighting.